We're very excited about today's programming. Last year, we focused on sharing information on the student experience. Uh, students spoke about their time at the GSD and their thoughts on the future. Today, we're focusing on designing for a planet in peril. And we're having that conversation through talking about option studios at the GSD. The conversation will explore how the GSD studios are investigating the relationships between climate change and the built environment on a global scale. The goal of this is event is to help hope that you leave understanding the GSD's priorities for climate education, specifically through the importance of what the work that we're doing in Option Studios. I'd also like to take a minute to acknowledge the great work that our alumni is doing around the globe in this space. So we value your efforts and your partnership in thinking about how we as a GSD family can make a change in the world. A few housekeeping events. This event will be recorded and the video will be shared on the GSD's YouTube channel in the weeks to come. If you have questions or comments during the event, please put them in the Q&A screen at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll have time for Q&A at the end of the event and we'll pull questions from those that you submit. My colleagues will also add links to the chat throughout the event as they relate back to the panelists' remarks. We'll start by putting a link to the GSD community value statement in the chat. With that, it gives me great joy to introduce Sarah Whiting, who is the Dean and Joseph Luis Sir, Professor of Architecture. And now to you, Sarah. Thank you, Peggy. Um, and thank you everyone for showing up today. I was scrolling through the participant list and it's nice to see a bunch of names that we know, some of our alumni, some of our friends, some of my former students, hello. Um, this is, I think, a really terrific format for uh, having a global and group conversation about important issues that we're dealing with at the school and that we want you to know about, but we also want to get your feedback. So um, it is one of the perks of Zoom, I would say, that uh, this is a format that's been made available to us, and we're very excited that we have so many people participating today. Um, so let me just, what I'll do right now, I'll give a very brief introduction. I want to give you a few highlights about the school and where we're at right now. And, um, and then I'll talk very briefly about um, today's event. And so just to give you some updates about the school, we have um, the highest enrollment in the GSD's history right now with uh, essentially almost a thousand students. Um, we're offering seven academic programs with 15 degrees. So it is uh, uh, an action-packed Gund Hall, and Gund, as you know, um, celebrated its 50th birthday last October. So um, the building is hopping, and it's it's just so wonderful to be back in person, um, back with the energy that Gund Hall offers us. Um, this semester alone, we're offering 150 courses, um, 36 of which are entirely new, which is just incredible. So we have, I think, really an amazing uh, group of faculty who have been making um, incredible offerings available to our students. I want to remind you, I think most people here know what my three priorities are for the school, um, but just to remind you and remind all of us, um, they really are um, uh, three important things for me for how we're taking the school forward. So the first is building on the core, building on the promise of the core, sort of acknowledging that the GSD has always had a very strong core, and that is very important to establishing our voices in each discipline, is that the core is a very important part of the school. Um, and then uh, building on that, really understanding that is our foundation, ensuring our relevance, and that's part of what we're going to be talking about today, is um, how the GSD engages in incredibly current and relevant topics, um, mostly doing that through our options and our, elect our option studios and our elective um, seminars. Um, and then expanding our reach, expanding our reach to constituencies beyond the school through formats like this one, but also through our publications, through our lecture series, which I invite all of you to pay attention to and join us um, either in person or virtually. I'll say actually one event this week that's very exciting is we're awarding the 14th uh, Veronica Rudge Green Prize in Urban Design. It's being awarded to Paris Grand Express, which is 
a extraordinary project in Paris that's introducing 68 new metro stations in the region around Paris, connecting all of the suburbs in a way that they've never been connected before. And so um, that is gonna be uh, launched on Thursday at 6.30 in Piper Auditorium. And there's an exhibit in uh, the Drucker Design Gallery in the lobby of Gun Hall. So um, other important news to touch on, um, we have launched our new, or we are in the process of launching our new master in real estate degree program. Um, we are accepting our new class to uh, launch this fall, so that's very exciting. Um, we're also going through right now the process of um, our new uh, curricular uh, innovation, which is open projects, which is in the Master of Design Studies. So MDES, um, the MDES students finish their degree all in what we call an open project, which is a collaborative research project. So there are six open projects currently um, around topics ranging from technology, trust, and governance to forms of assembly to black counter cartographies, among other topics. And so that's a new pedagogical invention. We're, we're um, seeing how that runs and very excited about that. Um, so there's there's just a, a, a lot going on, and I encourage you to um, zoom in to us uh, or uh, stop by even better or um, just look at what's going on by um, looking at the website. So to introduce um, today, uh, so our town hall, as Peggy noted, is um, uh, designing for a planet in peril. Uh, Everyone here knows uh, that there's nothing more critical for the, the planet than climate change, addressing climate change. And we as a school related to the built environment are very well positioned for addressing this through uh, research, through our teaching and through our practice. Um, so the, the school is really uh, trying to engage the future of innovative, environmentally conscious design practices, um, engaging urgent hazards of climate risk, the need to decarbonize our energy use, our material and construction practices, and also pursuing environmental justice through design at every possible opportunity. Um, it's just a, a, a core component of the school um, to engage how climate is affecting us across the school. Um, so this is uh, an, an issue that we see across the school in, in many courses, but I, today we're gonna highlight two courses that um, have taken place one last spring and one last this past fall. Um, that engage this from, I would say, perspectives that you might not have anticipated. So the spring 2022 studio, Wild Ways, A Fifth Ecology for Metropolitan Los Angeles, um, which was led by Chris Reed and Nina Marie Lister, uh, was a, a course that really looked at uh, how Los Angeles creates a new possibilities of creating new ecologies for um, uh, for non-human beings primarily. Um, and I would say that was an astonishing uh, final review in the school that um, still sits with me in terms of some of the um, drawings and projects and proposals uh, and an extraordinary uh, discussion. The second studio that we're gonna be looking at is a discussion, a studio that we had last fall in um, Au in France. It was a studio abroad that was co-taught by uh, Farshid Musavi and Hanif Kara. Um, and that was a, a studio that was looking at sustainable commons, the function of housing and urban mining. It was a, a studio that looked at issues of, of climate through looking at housing density and looking at uh, material, new material possibilities. And so that was um, a sort of extraordinary opportunity to do a deep dive into new materials and new ways of, of putting populations together. You'll learn more about that uh, from our guest today. And that was a studio abroad. So the students were in Al for the whole semester um, and they were, they were cited at the Luma Foundation. 
the Luma Foundation was established by um, one of our um, GSD Dean Leadership Council members, uh, Maya Hoffman, um, and uh, the Luma Foundation supports artistic creation in the fields of visual arts, photography, publishing, documentary films, and multimedia. The Luma is particularly focused on questions of climate, uh, and so it was a really appropriate place to have that studio based. Um, after the presentations, after the, the presentations of these two courses, um, I'll moderate a panel discussion followed by a moderated Q&A in which I hope you'll participate. Um, and so we're going to turn to the, the, um, the presentations of the two courses. Um, these will be led. We'll start first with um, the, uh, the, the Los Angeles um, studio with um, uh, Chris Reed and Nina Marie Lister. So um, Chris Reed is a professor in practice. I should note that he's an alum of our school. Um, he is a professor in practice of landscape architecture and co-director of the Master of Landscape Architecture and Urban Design program at the GSD. He's also a domain head of one of our new MDES domains or tracks as we call them um, at the ecologies domain. Um, uh, so, and he is the founding director of Stoss Landscape Urbanism here in Boston. Nina Marie Lister is professor in the School of Urban and Regional Planning at the Toronto Metropolitan University and visiting professor of landscape architecture here at the GSD. Um, and uh, she found, founded at TMU, founded in directs the ecology um, design lab. Um, so they taught this studio together last spring. They are teaching again this spring. So we've, we've got them paired up again as a phenomenal pair. Their student, um, Pam Setpakdi, uh, who is a MLA from class of 23, a second year graduate student will um, uh, show her project with them. So we'll start with them. And after them, we will have a presentation from um, Farshid Musavi, Hanif Kara and their student, Joel Holly. So Farshid is a professor in practice here at the GSD and the um, director of Farshid Musabi Architecture based in London. Um, she is uh, uh, phenomenal, I'll just say. Um, and then Hanif Kara is a practicing structural engineer, professor of practice of architectural technology at the GSD. He is also the design director and co-founder of ACT2, AKT2, um, also based in London. Um, and their student, uh, Joel Holly, who's an MARC, um, third year MARC one student, uh, will be uh, presenting his project with them. So we'll start first with you, Chris and Nina Marie um, and Pam. Terrific. Thanks, Sarah. Um, great to be here and great to join all of you. I'm so excited that so many of you uh, joined us this afternoon. It's an absolute pleasure to be here uh, with my friend and colleague, Nina Marie Lister. I'm going to say hi. Hi, everyone. The pleasure is also mine. Really excited to talk about this work. Excellent. And you'll meet Pam uh, as well in a few minutes, who did some extraordinary work. <laughs> Um, so, pleasure to be joining you, uh, the Wild Way Studio uh, in our second year, as Sarah said, uh, a fifth ecology for metropolitan Los Angeles. Here we're playing off, of course, Rainer Banham's characterization of the four ecologies uh, of Los Angeles, and trying to think, given the present situation, the present climate situation, the present social uh, situation, how is it that we potentially imagine uh, a new future fifth ecology that can deal with some of the issues that are most pressing uh, today. And so in this way, the studio explores themes of urban habitat, wildlife connectivity, resilience and landscape infrastructure through the lens of metropolitan scale civic infrastructure projects in and around uh, the Los Angeles uh, basin. It does so against a backdrop of the twin challenges here, of climate change and biodiversity loss in the Anthropocene. Climate change here is uh, exhibited uh, often uh, most distinctly uh, with wildfire, uh, which is increasing in intensity and frequency throughout the region. 
Um, it's also expressed uh, through the challenges of increasing temperatures and heat, and particularly uh, negative impacts on those least capable of dealing with these impacts, lower income, multiracial, multi-ethnic multi uh, communities. And then uh, starting, start, startlingly, excuse me, um, this weekend, um, it's also exhibited in terms of intensive, somewhat freakish rainstorms and snowstorms uh, that are blanketing parts of, of Los Angeles County. And so this wild weather that we're having um, is just part of the phenomenon uh, at stake. Uh, critically, it's also addressing uh, biodiversity loss in many regions uh, throughout the world. Richard Weller and others uh, in the Biodiversity Hotspot Cities Project has identified Los Angeles as one of a number of major cities around the world um, where biodiversity loss is at its most critical stages. And so we begin to ask, how is it that we start reversing uh, these trends uh, looking forward? The studio also is intended to foster conversation around and projects that address our relationship, as Sarah said, to non-humans and the environments we share, starting with the creatures and species um, that uh, live uh, around us, even if uh, pushed away. But importantly, uh, this is not an anti-urban or an anti-human endeavor. Um, rather, perhaps most profoundly, uh, it's an attempt to reestablish lost connections, to re-embrace the living world, to re-engage us as social and urban and ecological uh, creatures. Uh, Mimi Zeiger writes here that LA is one of two cities globally that have mountain lions within the metropolis, um, uh, quite dramatically. Uh, big cats fascinate Angelino, she writes, uh, and also makes uh, connections to some of the other celebrities uh, in LA, among those, uh, the Kardashians. Uh, it's also notable that LA has mountain ranges uh, within its municipal boundary as well. And so it becomes a perfect stud study site uh, for exploring these topics. It's also one of the most urbanized environments uh, in the world. Um, radical change uh, has happened, particularly during the 20th century. Um, and this for us becomes both the challenge and opportunity of finding new ways of thinking about landscape and landscape infrastructure moving forward. Yeah, the course for us, as Chris has noted, is really a door. It's a trope to discuss the entangled issues of social equity, our engagement with other species in times of tremendous turbulence and pressure, and no better place than this city of five ecologies, Rainer Banham's Los Angeles. And we're really plumbing these five ecologies to ask deep questions of new relationships and seeing through the lens or the sensory uh, apparatus, if you will, of other species, of course, inevitably, helps us engage with other humans as well at times of great trouble. We want to emphasize that this course is fundamentally first and foremost, foremost about imagining new civic landscapes and infrastructures that reconnect us, reconnect LA's wildlands in a global biodiversity hotspot that is under tremendous pressure on a direct collision course with growth and with other species, and also to connect humans and creatures in new and importantly empathetic ways. This work builds on a seminar that I worked on in tandem with Chris. We generated this project together that is now an opportunity for design agency and activism under the twin challenges of biodiversity loss and climate crises. So we're asking in the course, how can we imagine a new kind of urbanism? If you will, a zoopolis in the words of Jennifer Walsh, one of our key uh, readings here, and imagine and build a new human creature kinship. So empathy, entanglement, coexistence, these are all terms that challenge us to think, see, and design differently. We also are engaging with a number of ecologists on the ground to help us with our reading of the city in practical, tactical ways. Corinna Domingo, the founder of the Cougar Conservancy, for example, Beth Pratt, the, co the director of the National Wildlife Foundation in um, Los Angeles, concerned very much with the Cougar P22, who recently died after 12 years in the Hollywood Hills, and Kat Superfisky, 
the only city appointed ecologist, I think, in the area uh, responsible for Los Angeles's ecology. So these are some of our advisors that are opening doors and showing how we can materially engage with the wildlife, the others around us, in what ultimately comes down to managing human activities in a new civic set of infrastructures. And so where do we start? Um, for us, it's important to start with the species and the species lens. Um, here, together with uh, Beth and Kat and Corinna, Nina Marie and I developed a list of endangered and endemic species uh, to the area, species that exist, species that could be brought back. Um, and we began to understand not only what their habitat ranges are and were, um, uh, but also uh, what their habitat needs are. Uh, what are the ways that they move throughout the world? What are the ways um, that they are caught up in a set of ecological clusters? Um, uh, are they part of a food chain, uh, for instance? What are the other uh, plant and animal species caught up in these ecological uh, webs? Perhaps even more importantly, how is it that species sense the world around them? How is it that they move? How is it that they hunt? How is it that they see or hear or otherwise sense uh, what's going on around them? And then as we begin to explore some of those issues, we're also looking at some of the most uh, important and critical threats uh, to their existence. And so each student started last year with a single species, began to develop a really deep understanding uh, of all these aspects uh, of creature needs and the ways in which species, individual wildlife species, um, uh, exist uh, in the world. And so uh, the mountain lion was one of, of many species. I think we had 11 different species. Pam will talk about the California condor, glorious creature. Um, but, you know, um, we also looked at some creatures really quite small, the red-legged frog, for instance, the California newt, um, the Western fence lizard that does push-ups as it mates um, and has a really nice uh, blue neck uh, and underbelly. Um, the big-eared wood rat, for those of you who don't like rats, this is the good rat. Um, it's, it's, it's a nester. It creates good space underground. This was done by an architect who referred to the wood rat as the architect of the rat uh, species. Uh, and so each of these are looking at different scales of creature with different scales and needs of habitat, different ways of going around, uh, all the way to the kind of um, delicacy uh, of the monarch butterfly, uh, looking at the various um, ecological cycles, uh, diurnal cycles, um, uh, feeding cycles, growth cycles, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This all paints a really broad picture uh, of, of a, as a starting point for the work. And this year we've expanded uh, the work to really introduce a kind of layered complexity that exists all around us. Rather than looking at species individually, we've done so in a more realistic and challenging ecological and social context. Uh, we've paired them, looked at them in clusters. For example, here, the great horned owl together with the ground squirrel. Yes, predator prey, but also working at similarly resonant scales in the urban landscape. Uh, we also looked at uh, species that relate to one another in aquatic environments here, the beaver and the Western pond turtle. Why? Well, we're also looking at the reintroduction of species that are happening throughout California, remembering, of course, that this is a global biodiversity hotspot, so a place of intense endemism or where species only occur here, such as the El Segundo blue butterfly, a tiny creature that is magnificent to our eyes for probably one day and yet needs these shifting sand dunes in an urban environment that are somewhat at odds with the stability of architecture. Here, the California live oak, a charismatic and beautiful species, together with lichen that defies taxonomic category. It's actually a, a symbiont of several creatures together. So this was a more realistic way, we think, to engage with also inspiration for civic infrastructures, helping us to understand a relational ecology. It's also important to note here uh, the extraordinary and beautiful work that the students are producing, uh, the idea that design research here occurs through drawing, through representation, through uh, developing and advancing the tools that we all have uh, as designers. 
in addition to that, um, we're quite interested in engaging other people uh, on the ground uh, in multiple ways. Uh, folks from different cultures, different communities, and also designers uh, who are at work, uh, many of whom are, are actually alums of the school and have taught uh, as well. Uh, we'll be meeting with Alan Salazar, um, Fernandino Tataviam elder, uh, when we go out to Los Angeles um, uh, in a couple weeks, for him to share his own people's understanding uh, of environment. Mimi Zeiger will join us for a second year. Mimi Zeiger is an amazing cultural critic and writer. Uh, Michael Maltzan gave us a beautiful talk last year. Corey Henry and Mariana Banez will be involved in reviews and other discussions uh, as well, uh, both architects currently uh, in Los Angeles. Um, and as we said, it's not just about the wildlife, but how is it that we can create new civic infrastructure, new civic imaginaries uh, that also uh, implicate uh, the human. And we're pleased this year to have Hanif Kara and Eric Howler joining us for a two-day workshop on the design of civic infrastructure a little bit later in the semester. With that as a starting point, students then dive right in and begin to imagine uh, projects. I'm going to turn it over to Pam so she can share some of the work that she did with ZT. Pam. Uh, hi, thank you, Chris and Nina Marie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pam I'm from MLA2 program. Um, today is a pleasure to show my project from last spring semester that I work with Professor Chris Reed, Professor Nima Mary Lister, and my project partner sitting. And our project is called Airy and Airy, Air Ground, California Condor and Human. Um, next, please. So through uh, the upcoming context of the Los Angeles metropolitan area, our project aims to explore the relationship between the air and the ground providing conditions for the future range expansion of the endangered species, California condor. Okay, next. Um, so the California condor is an important species. It serves as a scavenger, cleaning up machines for our ecosystem. It has monumental quality and sizes and for the people, primarily like through the indigenous people um, and culture. Next. So the species was once extinct from the wild. The situation led to the recovering program that the scientists capture every single condors, um, foster and populate up them in the zoo before we release them back to the nature like years later. Next. However, for further expansion, we need to also rethink about the condition of the changed climate and environment. And we have to come up with the new ways of thinking and designing through non-human agency. How are we going to reintroduce the, this condor back to a different nature? Next. So through research on the behavior and quality of the habitat of the California condor, the condor forage on open terrain and navigates through green patches. They fly by soaring or riding the wind instead of flapping their wings. Um, they nest on tall trees such as um, redwood and giant sequoia, which are the native species. So next, um, the video we show, uh, we observe the relationship between the ground and the thermal updraft and the wind corridor that uh, help determines the bird's movement um, through their route. Yes, um, next one, yeah. So um, for the threat, like collision and electrocution with the existing structure of the power line is the significant threats. The most important factors are the urbanization and the search of climate change. More wildfire in the California area great, greatly affects the natural habitat um, area of like this species. So on the regional scale, we propose interventions that gradually reestablish the suitable condition for condor range expansion in a new climate context. And how could we design a microclimate that will foster the condor's behavior? Next one, okay. We propose a condor zone with a hundred year timeline development that will include three significant strategies working together, including zoning regulations, reforestation, and vertical elements. Through regulations, um, 
Okay, yes, this is our the three uh, strategies. And next, um, through regulations, we propose a new zoning on building height. Uh, we use this urban fabrics of high rise building to create the climate pattern, the wind corridor and thermal updraft from urban heat island that shapes uh, the wind for the condor flying route. Uh, next one, we propose green patches within the zone through reforestation strategy of the redwood and the sequoia trees. This will involve reintroducing the native species back into the urban area, providing a habitat for the condor while creating a more healthy ecosystem that could survive through changing up the climate. While in the future, um, considering like changing up the electricity infrastructure, a uh, grid to a cleaner system um, in the next slide. Uh, yes, like we proposed uh, the removal of power line within plant area. Uh, the leftover infrastructure will be retrofitted into approaching infrastructure uh, for the condors. So zoom into the detail to see how these strategies could be implemented on the further identified landscape. Um, how and next like to see how the activities could happen on a different part of the area in the different like elevation in this air and ground condition section. Um, the perspective here is like the overall look of one of our green patches, uh, the capped landfill where we create landforms and patterns of redwood reforestation to provide nesting sites and shape the wind tunnel for the condors. And um, the reforestation uh, methods here are provided in models like um, to fit uh, with the terrains. While um, next, the open grassland in the middle is used as a foraging area for the condor. This could be the area that we introduce how condor and people could live like side by side together in uh, an urban context. So from the current situation to like, this is our proposal to create a, a condor zone. And with the map of like these stakeholders that we hope to work together in multiple scales and agencies. So we hope that it could help expand the range of the condor and secure their coexisting with humans. And like finally, like through lenses of both human and wildlife, uh, the project promotes shared um, interest among condors, human culture, and urban context through the changing of the climate in the future. Um, I think we're going to end this with like our overall perspective here. So thank you. Great, thanks, Pam. I mean, you can see the extraordinary depth and detail and breadth uh, of a proposal um, uh, like Pam's uh, here. Uh, I'll give you a quick overview of a few other projects and then uh, give it over. I know we're short on time, so I'll give it to Nina Marie at the end to wrap up. Other projects, uh, Amphibian in LA, The Frog and the New, building on the kind of uh, culture of amphibiousness uh, and making connections between the ways in which we all begin life uh, in water, uh, in the womb. Um, these folks were interested in making human creature connections through childhood and childhood opportunities, through taking over uh, um, underutilized infrastructure within the basin and turning it to new habitats uh, that allowed for uh, not only uh, the new development of, of places for creatures to thrive, uh, but also opportunities for people uh, to begin to interact uh, with them. Again, always thinking about uh, the creatures, uh, various lenses, and the various sounds uh, and uh, signals uh, available to and through them. Um, uh, other projects here include uh, an extraordinary project of habitat butterfly, uh, starting with schoolyards uh, in South Central LA, um, getting citizen scientists as kids uh, to begin to develop new kinds of habitat patches within the schoolyard that they can then 
uh, bring home to other kinds of sites, vacant lots, parkways, um, even their own backyard, uh, to begin uh, opportunities to spread uh, incrementally across the city, new habitat, and, and frankly, new places for people um, uh, to, to experience. Multiple uh, new kinds of, of infrastructure, not a single crossing, but multiple crossings that, that recognize the multiple people uh, and creatures uh, at work. Ideas of rewilding the zoo, the old zoo, turning the idea of who's watching whom uh, inside out. Uh, and upside down uh, in many ways. Uh, and then a really lovely project, the Quail Trail that stretches all the way from the Santa Monica Mountains uh, down uh, to uh, the port. This year, we're uh, taking on three very, very large and complicated sites, one up in the valley at the Sepulveda ba Basin, one along the coast at the Bayona Wetlands, one uh, really just east of downtown with an, um, an existing LATC un Union um, uh, intermodal uh, terminal. Importantly, this all came about because of uh, uh, a multitude of interests. The first year, the National Wildlife Federation and ARC uh, co-sponsored uh, the studio. We worked with CAT and others at the City of Los Angeles to advance the work. And this year, we're benefiting from the support uh, that AECOM has provided uh, for the studio. This important support allows us to get out with students uh, to do field work, to, to visit sites, to experience the, the, the culture, the kind of endemic South, Southern California culture, uh, art, culture, and really just ordinary life uh, uh, along the river uh, within the city. These kinds of learning experiences are really quite uh, extraordinary. Nina Marie, I'll give you the last word. Uh, just to close, I'd thank you all for your attention and remind us all of that this work takes place against the backdrop of a poly crisis between the climate conditions of the moment, as I saw one of our viewers say, um, in a time when we're really looking at engagement with humanity, how do we make change in the world and do it responsibly with design activism, not just design agency? And of course, we're at a time when at the United Nations level down to national governments, most of this hope and opportunity takes place in cities. And that's exactly where WildWise begins and ends. Thanks so much for your time today. Great. Thanks, everybody. Excellent. We'll go right into um, our second studio presentation in from Al. So uh, Farshid and Hanif uh, and Joel. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Hanif, I, um, maybe you could say hello and I'll begin. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hello, <laughs> everyone. Okay. Yeah. Farshid's going to speak first and I'll speak second. Nice to have you all here. Uh, a big hello also from me to you all. Um, I have been teaching um, a series of research-led uh, option studios on housing since uh, 2017. Um, housing is one of the most urgent problems uh, of our time because it influences our well-being, the way humans relate to one another, uh, to the planet, and since uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, it is also for many a place uh, of work. Uh, housing is also one of our uh, big tools to address climate change uh, because it makes up a large proportion of our cities. Uh, now, this last fall, uh, Hanif, Kara, and I collaborated uh, on teaching a studio that we titled uh, Sustainable uh, Commons. And this was complemented by two seminars that we each uh, taught, um, uh, titled Housing Matters and Embodied Carbon. Uh, the purpose of uh, joining up seminars with the studio was to equip students with the opportunity to develop and learn from research that related to their studio topic. Now, we will take turns to uh, give you an overview of what we try to cover with these courses. And Joel uh, Holly, who participated uh, in these courses, will present an uh, overview of his uh, project, and he has kindly accepted to change slides. So next, please, um, Joel. Now, the aim of the studio was to address the unaffordability of housing in most major cities around the world, and also to the need to minimize embodied energy in any housing complex that we are building. Next. Um, the studio therefore set out to design 
housing as a common in which the city's diverse inhabitants would act as a community uh, in order to live more sustainable and affordable lives. Now, housing in the form of co-living has existed for a very, very long time throughout history, but it has usually been a one size fits, um, uh, size fits for all uh, solution denying uh, the existing uh, or the existence of uh, individual needs and desires amongst uh, the inhabitants. Next. Now, the challenge we set for the studio was to design for sharing, but also for individual rhythms, because unless uh, the co living, uh, communal living works for individuals, they are not going to buy into it. Next. Now, as was mentioned, the studio was, um, the, the students were based in Arles, uh, in the Lumo Foundation, which you see uh, in the distance, designed by Frank Gehry. Uh, Arles is a city in the, in the town in the south of France. Uh, it has a lot of attractions, uh, including historical sites, festivities, and natural reserves uh, that draw uh, a lot of people to it throughout the year. Next. As a result, the population of Arles um, changes um, uh, throughout the year, and it includes long-term residents, tourists, and um, seasonal workers who uh, support uh, all this uh, mobile population in Arles. Next. Now, instead of accommodating these different kinds of inhabitants of Arles, in separate types of accommodations, such as apartments, uh, Airbnbs, and hotels, etc., the studio developed uh, co-living proposals for how they would share uh, or come together under one roof and share some spaces as well as resources. Next. We use the seminar on housing matters to learn from exemplary precedents on subjects such as spatial diversity, appropriation, work live well-being and community, which we believe that would be uh, of interest and importance to individuals who would be in these commons. Next. When looking at historical uh, approaches to communal living, we were particularly interested in how co-living could actually lead to um, the saving of space and energy and would at the same time provide a room for individual individuality. Now, this case, for example, does provide uh, inhabitants with individual apartments uh, color in, in color blue, and it adds communal space in between, colored in yellow, uh, but it doesn't save uh, space or uh, any resources. Next. Now, this other type reduces the private space of each household by providing a communal kitchen. Next. An extreme approach to co-living uh, historically has been this example um, in the USSR uh, in which every individual would have just one small bedroom and everything else would be shared uh, clearly at the expense of any kind of individual freedom. And this has inspired recently a lot of these co-living examples that cater for uh, young people only and do not take into account other generations. Next. We coupled our co-living precedent studies with other case studies that highlighted how housing can cater to individual needs. Now, the arrangement of floor plates, for example, in this uh, residential block can provide individuals with a choice of how they might distribute their activities at home. Next. Including how they might want to work from home, whether inside the home, adjacent to the home, or nearby the home. We looked at different workers and their space needs. For example, next, Fanny is a jewelry designer. She has transformed a wardrobe in her workspace, which she can close in the evening to ensure she has a work-life balance. Next, Mike, on the other hand, is a blacksmith and he lives with Isabel, who is a fashion designer. They both work from home. Her workplace is situated within their home. His workplace requires a, sp a separate space beside the home. Next. Harrison, on the other hand, lives with an elderly lady um, through a home share arrangement and supports her with help around the house in lieu for a greatly reduced rent. Now, these um, two individuals 
need to be connected, but they require sufficient separation to allow them to have their independent lives too. Next. Now, we interrogated every single element of uh, a residential block and how they might participate in the building of community, uh, which helps people share space and resources, as well as giving people different kinds of freedoms. Now, floors of re residential block can provide people, in this case, with differently sized balconies, a choice of them, uh, that vary in, in, in amount of sun or shade that people might enjoy. Next. Designing for individual user appropriation uh, can also be another topic uh, when we are dealing with a lot of different people sharing a block. The location of structure in a block can provide people with the choice and freedom to reconfigure their apartments over time. Next. Sliding partitions can allow this to happen on a daily basis. Next. And movable shutters can empower individuals to vary their privacy and as well as shade and also reduce their dependence on mechanical systems. Next. Well-being in housing was another one of the topics we covered for how uh, different people might uh, relate to this subject. For example, well-being could mean exercise, it could mean gardening, it could mean recreation with neighbors. An open plan arrangement in this case can enable individuals to do exercise at home. Next, the rooftop of a block can also allow uh, for uh, recreation more communally. Next, and planted terraces, depending on their size and location, can promote mindfulness, community gardening, as well as biodiversity in the city. Now, our precedent studies uh, was combined with presentations by external speakers that expanded the students' experience beyond the collaboration that Hanif and I were offering to them. Uh, these um, uh, presentations uh, ranged in subjects um, and included, for example, Home Economics by Jack Self or Pascal Muller on recent experiments on cooperative housing in Europe. Now, students worked in groups uh, in the seminar and individually on their studio projects. Next. Each student designed a co-living block to house 250 individuals and proposed uh, in what way uh, it should be arranged to create a community where everyone lives according to their rhythm and yet contributes to maintaining the block as a sustainable common. The studio site was um, a former industrial wasteland along uh, the Rhone River in Arles, uh, just you see on the left, marked sites. Next. Interestingly, uh, there we found that uh, there is this uh, steel structure uh, deposited on this site that was designed by Gustave Eiffel, uh, originally for an exhibition center in Marseille. The students were asked to combine their co-living proposals with urban mining, which included the reuse of this structure. I will let Hanif to tell you all about it. Next. So one thing that the school's been doing um, in a very agile way is putting together architects and technologists in, in co-teaching studios. And probably the climate challenges is one of the areas in which that is the only way to face those challenges by bringing transdisciplinary interactions. So it's not just a collaboration, it's actually a live um, educational process, but also research for, for both Fashid and I. Next. Technologists like me um, mostly recognize and believe that in 2020, the Anthropocene mass exceeded the weight of natural biomass. So on the one hand, it's quite alarming, but on the other hand, you know, finding the, the steel on site gave us some hope as to what we could do with that, um, what we've already created as humans next. The other um, important aspect that we touched on immediately with the studio was the changing importance of embodied carbon in buildings. Because this has been changing, you know, since the 70s through to 2030, uh, in the in the last 50 years, operational energy and how we 
a feeder building with energy was probably at the forefront, but as green technologies dis are discovered and we try to tackle that, what's becoming very apparent is that 40% of the carbon footprint is still coming from what we have made as a building. So closer to the zero carbon targets, certainly in 2050 in Europe, we're beginning to see the, the uh, uptake on how do we deal with embodied carbon. Next, please. One of the important things about that is this shift that goes from um, whether we demolish buildings or not, and what do we do with them? Luma is particularly important in that sense because the region has developed a very mature way of um, finding material that are rescued. So it's now become a business and a value to rescue materials and then reuse them. This France, Belgium in particular, have developed a construction industry and are ahead of the curve in, in this sense. So we wanted to bring that into the studio. Next, please. The other important thing was really to get to the students quickly that it's not just about a big pie embodied energy. It's about understanding the different components in a different type of building. So as we were tackling residential, we wanted to know very quickly how much of the uh, embodied carbon comes from a frame and how much from substructure, how much from the skin. This was something they were told immediately. So there was no, no necessity to play around with a full pie, but really dig into each one of these. Next, please. For instance, the skin um, usually in most buildings is only um, alive for 20 years. We replace it. So this is a huge uh, penalty that we pay in terms of embodied carbon, whereas the structure can last up to 300 years, even if you haven't designed it for, for that. So this structure skin combination was something that was in our mind immediately as they started to think about housing. Next, please. The steel on site um, it, it is what we have described as one aspect of urban mining. I will talk about the second aspect uh, through the seminar, but basically the way this works is you allow the steel to, to be redundant and you use whatever's there in order to make a frame. Next, please. So form uh, now doesn't follow function. It forms, it follows what's available on site or nearby. So a bridge could easily become a building, even if you've dismantled it and so on. So there is a kind of new or inversion of how you might form make and redundancy of systems becomes quite an important aspect, particularly in the studio next. One of the difficulties in, in setting such a high bar uh, for the students whilst they're living there was really to first get them to um, the same level of understanding quickly. And the tool that we used for that was really um, get them all uh, familiar with a what we call the primer, which gave them systems and elements that could be used in their project as they start to develop the project. Next. So the primer was really the basis for explaining to them the high road and the low road, which is the high road being um, not constructing anything ever again and the low road build, being built new only. What was the, the, the studio going to do in between where it could use disassembled steelwork next? So an early uh, moment was really to give them the basics of, of what they could do formally. So what are the what is the anatomy of structure? And this goes all the way back to how they could understand quickly how every decision they would make in design could affect construction and would affect the embodied energy and in what proportion next. The primer was also given to, to collect quickly and bring everyone to the same level in terms of what space planning you need when you're designing bedrooms. So it wasn't just an architectural idea, but what do we do with uh, the size of rooms that are universally accepted as one, two, three bedrooms so that they could stack these or place them side by side. So the, the primer acted as a very uh, dominant tool in, in, in the way they would apply the structural systems next. So in, in collaboration or in trying to 
tackle the deeper version of embodied carbon, we were also cognizant that material cycles and circularity becomes an important discussion. Next. The first part of was really to grab these anachronisms because it's become such a wasteful uh, language where these things mean almost anything or nothing often and are very common now, both in practice and in regulation. So we wanted to grab quickly with the term urban mining specifics of how we would apply that to our studio. Next. Equally, the seminar was also addressing the different ways in which these students, when they go into practice, will encounter the way these uh, energy metrics are measured across the world. And this is the low fruit in a way. What I think the GSD is trying to do is get to, to the sky with this early on. So we don't follow what is prescribed. This is really to raise the ground floor. We're trying to push the ceiling next. So the race to zero carbon is slightly more mature over here in Europe than it has been in the US. I think it's catching up very fast. And one of the, the big things for us is to, as well as reducing energy demand, is to increase um, reuse of structures. Next. Um, there are at least six to 10 um, regulations now and companies in France specifically that are tackling geo-based materials and um, bio-based materials. So our specific focus was going to be, well, how do we grab what is in the industry rather than invent things that might never happen for 30 or 40 years? So geo-based materials and bio-based materials from near the site was our, our tactical approach because these are approved in, in most, most of France. Next. So the opportunity, as, as uh, Fashid said, you know, and, and the Dean, Luma has been doing this work for 10 years. They've been working on plaster and straw and different ways of making earth round structures, different ways of using stone already. And it would have been uh, foolish not to capture that. So the seminar was on the one hand, trying to cushion the demonization of steel and concrete, which is going on in the world, those are materials that are guilty, but we're not going to solve them very easily. So there was a whole kind of series of discussions on how green steel and green concrete would arrive next. But what was most important was really to get students to get really close for a week to the materials. Now, you might wonder, you know, why, why? And it, 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 is, it wouldn't surprise me if people say, well, do we really have to make these things? But to spend one week on your life close to these materials is life changing. You will understand embodied carbon better. And most importantly, it tells you how we've self-inflicted the wound that we have currently on climate. The distance between design and construction has become too big. And that's become one of our problems. When, when we draw and design and talk about structures, we don't really understand how they're made or the, what might happen to them next. Next slide. I think the students enjoyed this part. There were some injuries, but on the whole, we came out pretty safe. And Luma were also very pleased. We're hoping to pull together a document, but more than anything else, it's probably inspired many of us to, to, to try and do this kind of studios um, in the future and seminars. Next. Joe, over to you. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Joel Holly, and I had the pleasure of participating in the Sustainable Commons Studio in France, sponsored by the Luma Foundation uh, with Farshid Musavi and Hanif Kara. And I look forward to sharing my project, Common Ground, with you. Uh, the site of the project, oh, it's not wanting to click through. Just one moment. Here we are. Uh, the site of the project in all uh, sits at the seam of city and countryside. The city is dense, with a clear distinction between the built environment and the surrounding natural and cultivated landscape. But the city may seem removed from its agricultural surroundings. Its market, which occurs twice a week, displays the rich connection between Arles and its countryside, a precious relationship worth preserving. Oh, goodness. 
my bad, sorry. Um, however, uh, current concerns of a coming food crisis spurred by war in Ukraine and limited exports of fertilizer from Russia and China, in addition to rising temperatures and drought currently affecting Southern France, provoke skepticism and the reliability of governments to act responsibly in relation to issues of climate and food scarcity. The goal of common ground is to protect and strengthen the ties between the city and the countryside in all by making the boundary between the two less defined. This effort brings a portion of food production back to the domestic sphere, avoiding supply chains made unstable by lack of wisdom and governance while leveraging climate responsive strategies for sustainable food production. In the housing complex, long-term residents will be allotted space to grow enough produce for themselves and their loved ones using a highly efficient agricultural method called the biointensive method. This method produces high yields in a small amount of space with an emphasis on the replenishing of soil fertility through composting and companion planting. And seen here are a few examples of companion planting utilizing local crops in the region with potential for tropical companion planting in the greenhouse uh, seen in the lower right portion of the screen. Though it may seem at first counterintuitive for a warm climate or a warm region, uh, the project employs a passively climate controlled greenhouse. The greenhouse is used to increase humidity and reduce crop transpiration to greatly decrease the amount of water needed for agriculture in response to regional water shortage. During the summer when humidity is high, the greenhouse opens up to allow for passive ventilation, which is facilitated via the stack effect, bringing in cool air from below as warmed air generated through the greenhouse effect creates a convective flow. Warm air is then carried away by prevailing winds and the greenhouse further incorporates shaded workspaces, which feel up to 10 degrees Celsius cooler than the surrounding air and the roof uh, is designed to collect runoff water for uh, agriculture. Greenhouse infrastructure, such as the utility sink, workbench, supply storage, and seed sowing bench, are all used for gardening functions during the spring, as seen on the left, but can be appropriated for domestic use during the tourist season in all in an effort to produce housing for travelers. This infrastructure then becomes a sink for food prep, a workstation for remote work, clothing and luggage storage, and a sleeping platform, as seen on the right. The housing project must host a complex mixture of long-term, mid-term, and short-term residents given the local tourism industry. I chose to provide permanent housing units for long-term residents only. During the tourist and harvesting season, long-term resident demographics can lease portions of their interior space and greenhouse space to accommodate the life of mid and short-term guests. Together, these demographics, demographic clusters create a diverse and mutually beneficial community. Housing units are developed for each clusters, as you can see color-coded here, uh, according to their demographic needs, with an option to reside in a standard living unit, seen on the bottom row, or a, live in, uh, or a living unit which is more integrated with the greenhouse, letting the agricultural sphere invade the home, is seen on the top row. The units are positioned so that an interior courtyard is shared between the different cluster types, uh, while each unit also has access to small courtyards which face out into the landscape. The housing units are and their uh, corresponding agricultural parcels seen in this um, greenish yellow color uh, are terraced, which creates a raised gardening street with intermittent uh, collective working areas seen in this dark uh, in the dark red color. And the structural grid of the project is set by the optimal widths of uh, planting parcels. Pictured here is a view inside the greenhouse on the shared gardening street, where you can see different demographics uh, interacting with one another throughout their day, uh, gardening, working, um, and uh, moving about to their housing units. As mentioned previously, uh, residents are given a choice between standard living units and integrated greenhouse living units. The standard unit on the left is more typical of the domestic experience with domestic functions of the house being separate from gardening. 
while the details section on the right shows an integrated greenhouse living unit where one might dine or recline directly adjacent to their produce. In these detail sections, we can also see that the housing units are constructed with massive stone, a local construction practice in southern France, which has a lower embodied energy than mass timber construction. And additionally, reused steel sections from the former Gustave Eiffel structure found on site are used to create the greenhouse structure above the units. Here is an image inside of one of the integrated greenhouse units designed in accordance with solar angles so that kitchen and living functions primarily exist in the shade while crops receive between six and 10 hours of direct sun, allowing agricultural life and domestic spaces to coexist. Here, a second home owning family has paused their weekend gardening to invite their retired host neighbors over. They're currently leasing their guest room to a transient worker who cooks through the shared kitchen wall seen uh, at the back of the image and their son loses interest in his toys as he observes the sunflowers growing in his home. In this detail section of a lower level unit can be seen the interior space of a family of four on the left and their personal garden, gardening supply and maintenance space to the right, shaded by graded floors or great floors above. This passively conditioned shaded space in the greenhouse can be later appropriated for the housing of tourists when the homeowners are no longer sowing seeds. And pictured here is a view uh, from inside the kitchen of a lower level unit of, an, of the integrated uh, kind, integrated greenhouse living units. And here a man has risen early and made breakfast, breakfast for his family, sitting in his dining room, which resides in the greenhouse. He leaves the curtain open, saying hello to neighbors as they pass by, while waiting patiently for his wife to wake. His youngest daughter grows impatient and eats sunflower seeds from the garden. Common Ground provides permanent housing for 170 individuals, and by leveraging the affordances of the greenhouse, accommodates the life of 80 additional short and midterm residents. The project seeks to provide a closeness with agricultural production while offering flexibility as the resident circumstances may change. The housing complex creates a common ground between the city and the countryside. Short and midterm guests are, are invited to experience food production up close and share in the love Arl has for its quality food and beautiful landscape, in addition to their tours of the historic city. While permanent residents live in both domains at once, city and countryside, with confidence in their abundance through the highs and lows of political and environmental change. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Um, Hanif, I don't know if you if you want to add anything. I, I, I would just uh, say uh, that uh, Joel uh, surprised us with the, the, the kind of the intensity and depth of thinking that he um, threw in, uh, at his project and uh, what, he's, what he has uh, presented to you is a fraction uh, of, of his project. Uh, it was really useful to have the students so uh, focused uh, in this study abroad, uh, which actually gives you less time than a, a standard semester. Other students uh, picked other subjects that could um, be of, of uh, form the basis for common ground or sharing between uh, the inhabitants. You know, they range from sharing laundry uh, so that you would save on uh, both water and energy, as well as uh, bond with your neighbors to cooking or workspace. Uh, and some of the projects had a mix of these. Um, Hanit? I think I would just say that I wish we could show you all the renders of the earth rammed and other types of uh, materials that they all used from the seminars in their projects, some of which was beautiful. Yes, I, I mean, I have to say um, it, it was great uh, seeing both of these series. I'm going to ask everyone to come back on screen so that we can have a conversation together. Um, so Chris, Nina Marie, um, Pam, um, I, it, it was amazing seeing um, the work as a way of demonstrating the ambitions of these very ambitious option studios. And I, I um, think it, it's 
that it's just incredible to see sort of how um, uh, the option studios bring together so many different aspects of expertise and so many different uh, disciplines. So we we saw, and I, I, this partly answers some of the questions that we've been getting in a very lively chat on the side, which I appreciate. Um, but you know, we have uh, with the LA studio, there was the expertise of um, Nina Marie herself being an ecologist and a planner, um, Chris being a landscape architect, and then bringing in other forms of expertise, and then Al having you know an architect and a structural engineer, and again bringing in other forms of expertise. I I think one one thing that we all all of us who are practitioners recognize is to accomplish a project like this, um, these two that we've seen in such detail in 14 weeks or even less for the studio abroad um, to such depth uh, and specificity is really extraordinary. That just doesn't happen that quickly in an office with doing it as, as one person. So, you know, I, I really extend my congratulations to you. Um, e. Okpa started off the conversation in with the first question of, of sort of showing some question about simply the term climate change versus climate conditions, I would say actually climate crisis. I mean, there's a reason why we use this term, the planet in peril. Um, it is it is a absolute crisis, but we are able to at least contribute to uh, the betterment of our planet. And what I think is so extraordinary with these two examples of these, these studios and the projects that we saw is that they offer um, some hope on the horizon for ways of engaging, ways of bringing our expertise to these questions. I mean, um, LA, thinking landscape in LA, first of all, is already a little bit anomalous, but then to think of these wild creatures, condors in LA, I mean, who would think about this? Um, to, so to have that level of sort of optimism that you can change and, and offer something to a habitat, to animals in crisis, or the housing crisis that you recognize so clearly in Al, which is emblematic of the housing crisis across the world, and how one might contribute to different modes of living together and different materials. Um, I'm just going to put to the side um, Hanif's comment that there were some injuries in Al, which is not <laughs> something a dean wants to hear, um, but I was glad that they were small. Um, but I, I think that really this, the, the combination of these things, so I hope, E.E., that that has helped to address your, your question about terminology. I think that the, the key here is uh, possibilities with to address uh, how we can how we can not solve the climate cross crisis per se, but how we can um, make uh, contributions um, to it. Um, I think that that uh, I was interested in in Christopher Cosper's question of of essentially asking if you can I, if I understand your question, asking if you can complete a degree without engaging questions of sustainability or climate. And honestly, I think if you look at these examples, you see that this is, it's simply a topic that pervades the curriculum. Um, and that makes sense because we all work with materials and we're all um, affecting the built environment, whether existing buildings, and I think Al showed how one has to pay attention to existing materials and existing buildings and how we might adapt them and reuse materials or whether new new buildings and new landscapes and new um, cities. And so I think that it's it's um, a topic that, that simply is part of one's graduate education at this point. Um, but again, I would say that, that for me, the, the thing that I drew from these presentations is this combination of expertise, um, the, the value of bringing together the different kinds of expertise and the, the value also of bringing together pairs of faculty who can bring uh, different expertise to a, a course, the value of highly specific um, drawings and, and suggestions and um, uh, designs and yet a lens to the general questions. And I think both projects did a very beautiful job of, of looking very specifically and very um, detailed while also looking expansively. Um, questions of representation and how one 
translates these ideas to new audiences. I think that that um, both of these studios illustrate the priorities of the school um, in a very beautiful way of um, engaging in critical questions and expanding our reach by translating those through different media. Um, I, I would like to address one question, which is um, the, the question of, of sort of different constituencies that came up for the landscape um, studio of, of if you're if you're dealing with one species, how do you deal with the interspecies? And in a way, that's also applicable for the uh, for the owl studio the, of dealing with one constituency of an in, uh, one kind of inhabitant. But how do you deal with multiple inhabitants? And so I wonder if someone wants to jump in and save me from talking too much. Yeah, maybe I'll just say I was about sure. to just on the wild ways. Go ahead, Chris. Go ahead, Nina Marie. We're in a time oh. lag. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so on wild ways, uh, we started with one last year. This year we started with two. And the idea is to look at the interconnectedness, but uh, whose feeding point is always one or two, but it's important to understand that wider web. I think the emphasis this year, which Nina Marie has really doubled down on, is the idea that that we're starting with multiple uh, and even then expanding uh, from there. And that includes humans too. How is it that we interact in, in, in those webs? And so students here are oscillating, right? They start with one or two, they start to expand. And once they get a handle on that, they're turning their attention to how that coincides with urban issues, social issues, urban connectivity, and can we solve some of the same urban and human uh, uh, problems uh, by addressing wildlife needs first? Yeah, this is the way to see this is that it's really about understanding connectivity and that everyone, human and non-human, has the right to roam, the need for freedom, uh, feeding, foraging, shelter, and so on. And the way to look at these as design challenges is to examine a suite of species. And of course, they're simplified. Um, all representations of a complex ecology are simplified. But in doing so, it really allows both the students and our sponsors to think about ways we move and structure for, connect for connection. Um, that's the simplest way I could put it. The more complex um, ecology, I would say, is dealt with this year in terms of the what I would call from a epistemological minds that how we understand is to look at these as relationships, building relationships. Excellent. I'm, I'm going to um, add to uh, my question for Farshid, Hanif, and, and Joel, um, in addition to sort of interspecies in your case, if you can address the question that Same put in the, the chat to everyone, which is um, the question of affordability. Well, maybe I can I can uh, uh, say something. Uh, uh, we 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 really started uh, this idea of commoning, uh, uh, as I tried to to mention, uh, with an awareness that we must not suppress human diversity, meaning people of different generations, different interests have to be accounted for when we are trying to. Uh, find common grounds and uh, that historical and very recent, uh, some of the recent examples have focused on uh, either just one way to bring everybody together, assuming everybody would buy in to the same uh, way of life uh, or have assumed uh, that they are just dealing with one, one, one generation. Um, and it was a, a lot more difficult, of course. It's a lot more difficult, and it means that um, you know these commons or these co-living blocks need to be thought of as clusters. Uh, they need to provide clusters of perhaps um, co-living apartments that give it, give people the choice. Uh, and but at the same time, recognizing that when you have different generations in a block. Uh, there is so much good uh, synergy uh, there that we can uh, offer to people, you know, as as opportunities to tap into. For example, you know, elderly um, uh, uh, people 
uh, perhaps having a younger, um, you know, children nearby throughout the day rather than living by themselves. Um, you know, someone who might be very IT savvy, uh, you know, living close to someone who is not really interested in IT issues. Um, and they could have all kinds of exchanges and, and, and bringing dif differences very close by uh, mm -hmm. and really allowing them to also live side by side each other, uh, developing compassion and understanding, but also, uh, you know, recognizing that they will want to be separate sometimes. So th these were very much part of the com conversations we had in the studio and, you know, the students obviously dealt with it differently. I, I just wanted to add, if it was about affordability, is that the big lesson we're learning is that we have to rethink how we value buildings mm -hmm. and how we value what we're doing. So it's no longer about the, the nearest inch or how big or small your room is. The value equation is changing and embodied energy is playing a much bigger role. And somebody's asked that question about why is it that stone is less or less than timber in terms of embodied um, carbon these are the kind of questions that are still not answered because you have to think of sequestration when you talk about timber whereas stone can be reused for the next 10 centuries if you want to so the discussion amongst architects needs to uh, lead rather than just respond to industry and respond to the way your work is valued normally i think all of those equations change when you start to understand some of the things Rashid was saying but also how we might make buildings. If you were going to do dollar for dollar, most of what we showed is not affordable. But that isn't the point. The question now is how do we save and be kind to the planet? Yeah, and to, I mean, I think that that's a, a fairly provocative statement, Hanif, to say that most of what we're showing is not affordable. I think it's probably true, but I think that part of what we're arguing is as you say, that the questions of affordability need to be rethought. And I think, so there's a series of questions that have talked about sort of other actors that need to engage these questions. And of course, politicians, investors, voters, as Kathleen is pointing out, um, but also um, Jeffrey, I think you, you were um, asking about our relationships to other schools on campus and other expertise, you know, again, how much can you do in a 14 week um, studio? And I will note both of these studios had seminars attached, which I think is also a way of recognizing the need to have a very full um, curriculum to address these incredibly complicated questions. But I think that one of the things that our students are all learning is they have to become uh, citizens of the world as well, and and um, know how to engage who are the actors who have power, whether they be um, real estate developers, whether they be politicians, whether they be clients. Um, and our engagement with our sponsors, I think, has also um, exposed them to uh, ways of engaging the world in a benevolent and hopeful means. And so, I, you know, I think it's a very complicated question. I think I, I'm going to wrap up and turn over to Peggy, but I want to make one last point, which is that it's, it's easy to either um, sort of collapse in anguish when faced with questions that are so big in front of us, uh, whether it's it's the future of species, whether it's the future of landscapes, whether it's the future of housing, whether it's the future of these materials, um, issues of energy. And I think for me, what really gives me hope is seeing how um, these students and the way these courses are set up is offering um, some optimism for how we can engage, how we can um, find a way. And, and these are not naive, or um, simply representational answers. These are real design exercises that offer us design possibilities. Um, and to me, that, that leaves me incredibly hopeful. Um, I'm gonna turn this over to Peggy, our hostess, um, and uh, to close us out. Thank you, Sarah. Let's see if I can get my video on. I can't get my video on, but I can at least, you can hear me, correct? Absolutely. Okay. 
Um, so I'd like to uh, just take a minute to thank our panelists who did an amazing job. I'd also like to thank Ariella, Ruth, Taniqua, and Lindsay from my team for helping organize uh, this afternoon's conversation. We are thrilled that so many of you took the time out of your day to join us. We've just highlighted the tip of the iceberg. So community, sustainability, reuse, wildlife needs, climate challenges, embodied carbon, urban mining, affordability. We've really just covered the tip of the iceberg. But as Sarah mentioned, oh, there I am. As Sarah mentioned, we're, we really are committed to having every GSD student participate in studios like this. And as a result of that, um, we've launched the GSD Design Studio Fund. So these studios, you know, are, not, are they come at a cost, frankly. And we, uh, Chris, I think mentioned several of the sponsors when he was talking about his studio. So we would love for you to consider a sponsorship at any level of this amazing work, because we believe that this work in combination with the work you're doing in the field really, really puts a stake in the ground for what design can do for climate change and the ways that we can really impact the future. So there is a link um, that will be over in, there it is, support an online studio today. And um, I know you'll probably find this shocking, but you'll hear from us in the future. We would love to, uh, to keep you engaged in this dialogue. We really welcome the opportunity to hear what you're doing with respect to climate too. So thank you so much for your time for today. And together, we really can put a dent in, um, in the future of, of climate change. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Um, we are really excited to have had this opportunity to share with you some of the work going on at the school. Again, I suggest that you stop by, you continue to join us in different events. And as Peggy said, you find ways to support the school and the way that we can um, continue having this work happen at the school. Um, the, the future of design is in the hands of the next generation. Um, and we saw that today, and that's what the school is all about. So it's a very exciting place to be. Thank you so much for joining us.